my name is Mark Remus, and I'm an associate professor in the School of Public Health and Health Systems at the University of Waterloo. I'm also an associate scientific director for the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. And today I will introduce Dr. Verena Menick. Uh, Verena is a full professor in the Department of Community Health Studies at uh, the University of Manitoba. She holds a Canada Research Chair in Healthy Aging, and uh, her main research interests lie in, not surprisingly, the area of healthy aging, uh, the determinants of healthy aging, age-friendly communities, and healthcare utilization among older adults, particularly at the end of life. Um, Verena has a direct connection to the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. She is the local principal investigator of the Manitoba site of the CLSA, and she will be speaking to us today on age supportive environments and healthy aging. Just a word about process before I give the microphone over to Verena. We mute everybody, and that is simply because if everyone was unmuted, there would be a lot of feedback, and you wouldn't be able to uh, hear Verena present. So because you're muted, if you have a question that you would like to ask of our speaker, uh, at the lower left-hand side of the window for the Blackbird Collaborate application, you'll see the chat feature. Just type your question into the chat feature, and at the end of the talk, I will read out the questions to everyone and give Rena an opportunity to answer your queries. So I'll stop talking now, and I will pass the baton over to Rena. Rena? Thanks for having me and letting me speak on age supportive environments or actually as I uh, probably more commonly will refer to them as age friendly environments, age friendly communities because that's the term I have used, they are used interchangeably so if I switch back and forth that's um, not an issue. Now, um, in, Mark said to type in questions, I really do encourage you to use that chat function I have to tell you this is rather odd sitting in front of my computer and talking to my computer. Uh, I thought maybe I'll talk to my plants over there, but so if, if you can even just say hi once in a while just so I know that I am in fact talking to somebody, that would be great. So maybe somebody can just say hi, that would be really wonderful. Uh, <laughs> great, thanks. I'll keep an eye on those. Uh, <laughs> Very cute. Thank you. See, that makes me so much better. It feels so much better. Okay. I, I, I feel obliged to start off with the world is aging slide here, as you know, and I'm, I know you know that the world is in fact aging. Um, it will grow to projections say that we will have um, 2 billion individuals aged 60 plus, this is based on 60 plus year old age cut off in 2050. So really the issue around promoting healthy aging has come to, to the attention of certainly not just researchers but very much policy makers. Um, so making communities age supportive or age friendly is proposed as one of the solutions to promoting healthy aging. Let me give you just a little bit of a, um, a rundown in terms of what are some of the historical perspectives on that relationship between aging and healthy aging uh, and the environment. And this is highly select, as I pointed out in the, uh, in the title, because clearly I just picked and uh, chose a few items. Um, in gerontology, uh, those who are in gerontology are, would be very familiar with environmental gerontology. Lawton would be the name associated with that, who, you know, starting in the, in the 70s, early 70s, ta talked about uh, person environment fit, so the relationship between the person and as that person is embedded within an environment. We have many, many determinants of health and I would just say healthy aging models because it applies as much to healthy aging as it does just to health, uh, which also outline 
uh, that uh, physical, physical and social environment is, uh, is, a, is one of the determinants of health and or healthy aging. And uh, those of you who are familiar, for example, with the Evans Stoddard model 1990, uh, those elements are in that model and certainly in many others. Uh, just in, as a more of a policy document, the Mid Madrid Plan of Action in, uh, in 2002 had one of the action items, among many, many action items, uh, talking about ensuring, enabling, and supportive environments as being one uh, important aspect of promoting, of dealing with an aging population, of supporting an aging self-population. Uh, some of you may be familiar with all the literature out of the public health field, which has been growing enormously, enormously, I guess, in the last, what, 10, 15 years in terms of the relationship between the social and also very much so the physical environment and various health outcomes. For example, how does neighborhood walkability relate to uh, physical activity like walking? And we in turn know that walking is good for health. Or how do obesogenic environments uh, relate to weight and consequently also, consequently also to health? So there's a very large area, a lot of research in that area, uh, which has really more recently also been applied to older adults. Uh, the last um, issue that is uh, the last document, I guess, that one I wanted to refer to is the. Uh, the uh, thank you, Brenda. I'd like to have know that again. I'm talking to somebody. Uh, the WHO in 2007 uh, started to talk about age-friendly communities, and I'll go a little bit in more detail into that because it really has been the foundation of my research in this area. So. In 2006, the World Health Organization launched the Global Age-Friendly Cities Project. This project was designed to really identify what makes a community, a city, a neighborhood, an area age-friendly. Uh, the, the brochure that you see and you can't read, you were not intended to be able to read that, is just a pamphlet that came out at the time really describing what this project was about. There were focus groups conducted. Uh, around the world uh, as part of the project, and it led to a guide about how to make communities more age-friendly. In that document, so both in the brochure there, but also in the document, an age-friendly community is described as one where uh, policy services and structures related to the physical and social environment are designed to support and enable all the people to age actively. Aging actively here is not just physical activity at all, but it's, it's more broadly conceptualized in terms of uh, security health. Uh, as well as, uh, as participation. So in terms of then the WHO framework, there were uh, eight domains proposed that are critical to an age-friendly community or age-friendly city or age-friendly neighborhood. You can, it doesn't matter really what scale you're looking at it. Uh, and they involved uh, transportation, housing, social participation, respect, social inclusion, civic participation, employment, communication, information, community supports and health services, and then outdoor spaces and buildings, which is very much related to the physical environment. So a number of areas that was, were described by the, uh, the, the WHO as being critical. Uh, and really the link towards, to, to health. Uh, so if you had an age-friendly community, that presumably one who could promote uh, healthy aging. Uh, in 2007, the Global Age-Friendly Cities Guide was released, so you can find that easily online if you're not familiar with the document. Uh, if you are familiar, you uh, or if, if not, I would also point you to a Canadian document Age-Friendly Rural and Remote Communities, a guide, which was also released in 2007 as a parallel project, parallel document to the city's guide because, uh, because of the awareness that rural and remote communities are different, they're different challenges. Uh, and so uh, there was a Canadian project that very much also looked at the same issues of transportation, housing, outdoor spaces, but in a rural and remote context. Again, you can easily find that online under the title Age Friendly Rural Remote Communities, a guide. Um, so that's the, 
the way the context in terms of, of the background, how I came into the age-friendly area because I was uh, doing, was part of the age-friendly cities project as well as that rural remote communities project. So let me give you a little bit more detail around the context of my research. Uh, one of them is in terms of conceptual framework um, using an ecological framework. So that's building on various ecological frameworks as well as lots and the idea of the person embedded within the environment. If you look at the diagram in front of you, we're starting with the older person in the middle. That person is embedded within a family and friendship environment, so there's a social network, but then the person lives in a community and is also then living within a larger policy environment. All of the factors, all of these factors impact the older person and how that individual will age. Just in terms of community environment, I've put in some of those domains that would make a community age friendly, like the physical environment, uh, so outdoor spaces, buildings, housing, and again, social environment, which is more the, uh, the social cohesion, perhaps, uh, so other social factors, and so on. Uh, in terms of the social connectivity piece that's in the middle there in yellow, if it shows up in yellow on your monitor, it does on mine, um, the idea being that, that really an age-friendly community connects. It connects people and it, 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 there are various social aspects to an age-friendly community. Fundamentally, it promotes social inclusion and um, at any level that you would look at, there's a certain that, that, that connectivity factor. Intentionally, we used here the term social connectivity to, to stay away from specific concepts, but you could plug in in certain contexts. You could think of it as social capital at the community level. You could th think of it as social uh, engagement at an individual level, and you could have a connection, more of a partnership type of connection, more on the policy uh, uh, environment level that interacts with the individual. So broadly then, we're using an ecological framework to situate the research. The other context I need to mention is that uh, my research is in the context of the Age Friendly Manitoba initiative. This was a government initiative that was launched in 2008 on the heels of the World Health Organization Age Friendly Cities project designed, the initiative designed to make communities throughout Manitoba more age friendly. There are currently 100 communities part of the initiative and the little red dots on the map of Manitoba there uh, show you those communities. It goes, it spreads out around the whole province and those of you who know Manitoba know that it's a very sparsely populated province but very large geographically so you go way up into the north uh, where populations are uh, very, very sparse. Overall, 80% of the population are part of communities that are part of the Age Friendly Initiative. So in terms of research, we've done a re uh, our extent scope has been into most of these communities, not all of them, not all 100, uh, but uh, many of those. Methods-wise, uh, we use surveys, some very much mixed methods, service interviews, neighborhood audits, for example, um, photo voice. Some of the results, some of the, the images I will show come from a photo voice methodology project where people are given uh, cameras and they are, were simply asked to take pictures of what they thought was age friendly or not in their community. They filled out journals and they were focus groups and uh, it's a very nice methodology to give a really rich description of what is age friendliness or an age supportive environment. We also have expert opinion groups and all, all, in all the research is very community based, uh, it's very applied in nature, it's designed to help communities become more age friendly while at the same time finding out more about what we mean by age friendliness. So in terms of just giving you a bit of an overview then I, of, of our findings and what we've learned over the years, so this is research that's gone on for, gone on for several years, for a number of years. First of all, I just wanted to briefly talk about what is an age-friendly community and then also more applied in nature, what, what factors help a community become more age-friendly? 
what are some of the community level factors, also more broadly, the uh, more, more broader issues that I'll talk about in a moment. So what is age friendliness? I presented earlier the WHO domains, uh, they're very broad domains, but within those, so what makes a community age friendly? Um, and there are many, many factors that make it age friendly. Uh, you have the physical environment, you have the social environment. The pictures that I'm showing here and the, and the uh, comments, uh, the, uh, the comments are in italics from participants who had cameras, so these are pictures taken by them. We get a lot of different issues, the sidewalk issue, the ice issue is an example. Um, on the right side you have buildings which may look really kind of nothing special there, uh, but really the, co the person said this is a community within a community for seniors, very positive, there are a lot of individuals there, it's a social environment. So clearly there are many, many aspects of an age-friendly community, way too many than I can go into at this point. I just want to highlight the opportunities and choices piece because I, I think that's an important one. I simply love this quote from a participant. You want to go skydiving, fine, it's your individual choice. I think this is just great and really in a way it, it underlies age friendliness. You want to have choices, you want to be included, you want to be independent, you want to have services, but you, you do want to ultimately have choices. An age-friendly community is intergenerational. This is one of the things that um, has come up at many levels in, in a lot of the, the discussions, the focus groups we've had, the various individual interviews, and this is from an, a participant in the For the Voice study. If you build the community for seniors, the young will come, but when you just build the community for the young, the seniors will disappear. It is age-friendly, it is not just senior friendly, it's not just aged friendly, it's, it's a community for everybody and if one builds the right community for everybody, older adults will be included and will have better quality of life, one would imagine. So the intergenerational com uh, component of an age friendly community. Another factor is that the factors in the physical and social environment are very much interrelated and I just pulled one quote out to illustrate this. This is a picture of a building and you could just look at it as a building, but it's a lot more than that of course. It's housing, but it's also activities, like exercises, meals, getting together, it's a social environment and on top of that, the person brings in, and it was certainly not the only one who brought in the transportation. So yes, you have a building where social and physical programs, exercise programs are provided, but you need to be able to get there. So when you look at age-friendly, age-supportive environments, disentangling the physical from the social is perhaps not even possible nor desirable because there's so much interrelated in people's minds. And at one point I started to talk about uh, the glob, that it's just a, a glob of stuff. People put it all together, they mush it all together and, and it's how people live. You live in a physical environment but it's not just that alone but of course it helps you be socially engaged and uh, so it's a, broader, it's a broader issue than just one or the other. Let me just actually get back, there's another comment to this issue from a research perspective that makes it a little more difficult, the whole topic, because as researchers we like to isolate effects, we like to look at simple, simple effects and, and look at preferably causality and specific relationships, but people don't really talk about it like that, they really talk about various aspects being very much interrelated. Um, taking into account the diversity of seniors is absolutely critical. Um, there, uh, there are various characteristics of older adults, aging individuals. Uh, income is one of them that impacts, that is almost one of those cross-cutting issues uh, that makes a big difference if 
one is older and with a, with a good income, secure, stable financially, it, there is barriers though are not as big. Uh, I've given you a quote from, um, from the north, this is northern Manitoba, seniors on a limited income use this mode of transportation um, and this is to get to Winnipeg, sometimes for healthcare services which are located in Winnipeg and the trip is nine hours. So that's a long, long trip for somebody. Maybe if one had more income, one could fly down. Uh, mobility is another intersecting issue. Challenges become greater when one has mobility problems to get around versus not uh, so in terms of, let's say, physical issues, physical disabilities, it gets harder to get around. Uh, mobility more broadly, if one does not have access to transportation, it gets harder to access services, to get uh, to programs, to get to facilities, to get to healthcare services. So clearly, people are not homogeneous, are not a homogeneous group. Some of the major issues that we heard throughout our research in Manitoba, I would suspect this is similar in other jurisdictions. This is especially issued in rural, in rural areas. Housing and transportation are big housing in terms of having different, a range of, range of housing options for older adults, assisted living, uh, independent living, right size, supports. And then again, that transportation issue, how do you get around to maintain independence, to get to services? Big, big issue. So that's kind of a, a bit of a flavor of, of what is age friendly, what are some of the issues. Let me turn to some of the aspects of what makes a community become more age friendly. What are some of the facilitators, some of the barriers? Um, first of all, this perhaps doesn't quite relate to this, but I put it under this umbrella, this slide, in terms of what have people done, what have communities done in terms of becoming more age-friendly in Manitoba. We did a process evaluation some, uh, some years into the Age-Friendly Manitoba initiative to find out what has been happening in what has been happening in communities, so what have they done in terms of projects, and also what processes they have they used to become more age-friendly. Uh, and clearly, short-term, small projects were easier to implement. That does comes as no surprise because it's much more easy uh, to install a power door or repair sidewalks even or put a bench in rather than tackling the really big issues which are housing and transportation. So, so creating housing, new housing is going to take years so we would not see that show up. The pictures here are Manitoba pictures. Uh, I like the top one on the right because that's a machine that shapes down sidewalks and makes them more even, which I thought was a really nifty approach. Uh, sidewalks being a big issue for seniors that came up again, both in terms of being uneven for walking, or presumably also for uh, scooters. I don't know how that affects, how scooters are affected by uneven sidewalks, but then also in the winter in terms of maintenance and ice. So small term, uh, short term, small projects for uh, fairly easily implemented and the bigger ones were still on hold. In terms of other factors, leadership is critical at the community level, an age-friendly committee uh, that is in Manitoba we have a context that where communities have age-friendly committees, so if, if it's a good age, if it's a functional age-friendly committee, a very engaged one with a champion things move along much more easily to become more age-friendly, or at least move towards becoming more age-friendly. Uh, community plans are critical, the community consultations, uh, so needs assessments, what is needed, what are the priorities, and integrating age-friendliness with other initiatives or strategies also is, is an important factor. So some communities that were very successful in starting to move towards becoming more age-friendly, um, putting this rather uh, in a convoluted way because really you don't become age friendly overnight. It's, it's a complex issue when you think of all the domains that you could address and all the issues and factors you might want to address. So it's really a process of trying to become more age friendly over time. So integrating that with other strategies is really 
quite critical, for example, in terms of health promotion programs, uh, safe neighborhoods, walkable neighborhoods, any time a community started to link those concepts together, which naturally fit together, they, were, they made more, better progress. Communities that promote the age friendliness uh, tend to be more successful than those who don't, and partnerships are absolutely critical. Uh, this is not one issue for one organization or even one jurisdiction. It's municipal, it's, it's provincial, it's uh, partly also federal in terms of promotion. And from a research perspective, just as an aside, research perspective-wise, this is very much uh, an area where uh, interdisciplinary research is needed because you're cutting across disciplines and, uh, uh, and issues, so no one discipline really has cornered uh, the market on age-friendliness or age-supportive environments. Some of the big challenges uh, that communities have experienced are volunteer burnout, competing, de competing demands, uh, you know, it's just yet another issue that they need to attend to besides uh, infrastructure and who knows what else, and lacking budgets on top of that perhaps. So lack of leadership was a real issue as well uh, at the municipal level and it's also certainly very much required, I think, at a, at a larger regional or provincial level to really promote this concept of, of age-supportive environments and the ben potential benefits that it could reap. Funding, big, big issue. Communities are challenged to, to, to get funding for issues. Again, the big ones are the big, have a real challenge, like, like housing, transportation is another one. Uh, retrofitting old neighborhoods that are not designed uh, the right way, so, so remedying old mistakes becomes very challenging, time-consuming, uh, and uh, costly. Um, another issue really is the communities themselves, so of course they vary tremendously. Uh, the, the graph on the right is just to say that communities vary in terms of age friendliness. So we, we have a, we developed an age friendly index, an age friendly survey that, that tries to capture a lot of these domains that the WHO talked about, uh, including um, uh, the housing issues, transportation issues, recreational programs, uh, uh, community supports and available availability of them and so on. So we create an index and just simply here is just the mean on this index across a number of communities in Manitoba and just the line, just the height of the bar just tells you how age friendly the communities would be and there's a tremendous variation. And some of that variation is due to the location of the community. So, so some communities are less age friendly than others. Uh, just because geographically they're different, but also historically they're different. And in Manitoba, for example, the northern communities are quite different from southern communities. They're mining towns. They tend to be young communities where aging hasn't been a possible. Aging in place has not been possible. So they haven't had to really deal with an aging population. Um, they're also geographically so isolated that, that issues of transportation and creating housing and and various other issues become a real challenge. So location matters, size matters in terms of becoming more age friendly, um, both in the positive and negative, and I'll mention that briefly again um, in a moment. Uh, I've just added a few points here, bullet points, but you can think of others. I've has added the history, and I think my example of a mining town comes to mind. I mean, just the difference in a mining town versus a southern place uh, in Manitoba, more southern community that might be more agricultural in nature. Communities differ. Communities differ in terms of social capital. So, so just kind of how, how engaged people are and what the historical perspectives are in terms of, uh, of the community cohesion and that helps in terms of age-friendliness and makes a difference in becoming more age-friendly. So again, to reiterate here that these communities are diverse. They have strengths and weaknesses. 
some may have really strong social ties and, and this is now from expert opinions where we ask people, so experts in the field, so what does what helps uh, an, a community become age-friendly, be age-friendly, a rural and remote community more specifically? So small rural communities actually have an advantage. They may have strong social ties. They have local leaders that are quite accessible. They, they, it's easier to engage residents. And they may be used to being self-reliant. On the other hand, uh, they do have those big weaknesses to overcome, like geographic distances, which has transportation implications, you have lack of availability of services and so on, and uh, difficulty attracting resources. So every community will have various strengths and weaknesses, whether the community is large or small, and uh, then dealing with those becomes, uh, um, becomes an issue. The broader socio-political context makes a difference makes a difference. There's an extra S there that should not be there. Um, so the broader, and what I mean that by that, there's the perceptions of ingrained, perceptions of aging, losing independence, and asking the, the difficulties for people to ask for help. So I think in terms of my, my conclusion, we really do need to tackle those broader issues which sometimes relate to ageism. Um, and it does come from seniors themselves. And I'll give you two quotes here um, in terms of the first one came in the context of people not wanting to attend senior centers. Um, and I like the comment, somebody 75 years old who will not come to the senior center because they're not old enough, clearly, I mean, this, the person thinks this is uh, an, an issue. And the second one, it would be terrible if you had to admit that you were so lonely that you had to call and ask for a visitor to come to your house. So some of the challenges in are not less flying in communities, not being a having the right social and physical environments, but come from within, from from social norms, from people needing to change their attitudes about aging and also uh, asking for help. Uh, trying to access services that might actually be there, which requires that they know about them, but also then to access them. Secondly, the importance of the grassroots, the community-based approach and the provincial government, I say provincial government, but it could be a regional government approach. So communities cannot become age-friendly without that larger uh, community, uh, larger support and often the funding that needs to come from provincial government. Again, very much that uh, ecologic framework where you have different influences at different levels, all of which interact with each other. This slide is simply to reiterate some of what I've said. It's again circles. I happen to like circles, uh, so I tend to think in circles. Here we don't start from the person but from the community in the middle, what makes a sustainable age-friendly community? Uh, it requires leadership, buy-in at the leadership level, at the community level, it requires engagement, it requires partnerships, but then all of those factors are also moderated by various broader community characteristics, and I've just highlighted a few, you could add many more, history, population size, uh, demographic mix, so is it the young community, is it an older community? Younger communities may not see age friendliness as, as important. Is it uh, an urban, rural, remote? So what's, what's the location? And not just the location itself, but where is the, the, the community situated uh, relative to other communities? And then overall, if there's a policy environment, there's a socio-political environment that all impacts whether communities will be able to become age-friendly. So just some overarching considerations, uh, and there are many more. I've just picked a few. Uh, one of the really difficult questions to address is, so what is a desirable level of age-friendliness? So how age-friendly can a community or a neighborhood or a city reasonably be expected to become? That's not every community will be 
completely, 100% age-friendly, however we would define that. Uh, it depends, again, on what the location is, what the sociodemographics are, and so on. So, so really disentangling what, what sort of, what's kind of the minimal requirements that we would, would strive towards. So yes, there's the ideal we want to be really age, have age to 45 environment, both in the physical environment and the social environment, but, but then what is the reality? We really haven't disentangled this one uh, yet. Do people want age-friendly communities? Uh, it's an assumption that we, and certainly us working in, in aging, we, we think having a environments that help older adults age well are very important, but not, not everybody would think that. We're competing against other areas, other issues. Uh, you know, just think of environmental pollution. We have economic factors come in. So what are the facts, you know, how to, can we bring the agenda forward more strongly as an issue? And how can we also work at various levels in terms of policy makers, but also the general public to make uh, it more clear that age-supportive environments are quite, are very important to people's lives and will be important for everybody, and even those younger people, at some point, they will be older. Age-friendly for whom uh, refers to that interaction between the person and the environment, and who we're actually talking about. I mentioned before that various barriers, for example, in the physical environment, they really become an issue when they're, depending on the person, when there are disabilities. It may not be an issue for people who, who have no problems. And I noticed uh, Kathy, Kathy, hi Kathy, you're on the, on the webinar. Um, uh, people with, without hearing problems will not even realize that restaurants are, or may not realize as much that restaurants are really bad places for, for people. But when you have a bit of a hearing issue, that becomes a real, that becomes much more salient. So how? Do we make environments age-friendly, but who, who do we target? The big, big question is, when we have big policy initiatives, like an age-friendly Manitoba initiative, does it actually contribute to healthy aging? Now, we're, I started off with the assumption that it does, but we really need to test that, and that will take time. Initiatives are, are young yet, so we can't really demonstrate effects. From a research perspective, of course, we can look at other data uh, and, and see what are some of those expected relationships between the social and physical environment, uh, very broadly defined those domains uh, that I had at the very beginning, and how do these relate to various health-related outcomes as well as then health. Let me just conclude with saying a word about CLSA and how it might support this issue around uh, this area of age-supportive environments. Um, there are variables uh, in, well, there's, there's the variables, the, the measurements around everything in CLSA, or there will be measurements around everything in CLSA. But currently, in the maintaining contact questionnaire, there are environment variables, and there are two levels. One is at the housing level, which is an environment that I haven't talked about, but that also you could think about in terms of age-supportive environments. So that's at the housing level. How do we create housing with the, for the person living within that environment, and how can it be better made? And so there are questions around that. And then there's broader uh, community uh, context uh, questions, uh, which focus more, a little bit more on social cohesion, so more the social environment. As an example, most people in this area can be trusted. And we, we have research that says that that social environment is important to various health outcomes. So that can be looked at. And may also the possibility of data linkage. For example, very simply, we could look at rural-urban differences. Uh, we might link uh, uh, census data to CLSA data. And as those are just two examples, maybe there's other data that could be linked in geocoded to the CLSA data. So in the short term, these are some of the ways to look at, at the environment in CLSA. By the way, there's also transportation questions, which um, will give some indication of how people get around. And I would think in the, uh, in the future, there will be other uh, variables that 
will come into CLSA that again will maybe talk to the broader environment. So I'll end there. And I saw there were a few comments there that I couldn't quite see as they were passing by, but uh, that I can address in the questions section. Great. Thank you, Thank Thank you very much, Marina. Marina. This was an excellent talk. Mark? And Great. I enjoyed it thoroughly. And I'm sure that uh, the listeners enjoyed it uh, equally as thoroughly or even more thoroughly than I did. Uh, there was one point uh, that was made uh, in the first 10 minutes of your talk, someone said, good point about the person environment transactions. And then there was uh, Kathy's comment, and I think that you have addressed it. If not, Kathy, you can just uh, type uh, a question if you require further elaboration. And we have a question from Pam. Uh, and she says, there is a question of who will pay for all the age-friendly initiatives. The major tax base will be younger people who will be a minority. They won't be able to afford all of the changes. And I guess this is uh, very yeah. similar to, uh, for example, people are sounding alarm bells about uh, the Canada Pension Plan, whereby uh, more and more people are drawing upon the pension yeah. plan and uh, there is an ever uh, smaller base of people paying into the plan. And of course, uh, people who pay into the plan today, that money is being used to pay um, pensioners today. So there's questions of sustainability uh, of the Canada Pension Plan in the future. And I guess Pam's uh, comment is, is related to that. As population ages, the tax base of younger people might diminish. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's an implicit assumption here that, that only younger people are taxpayers, but older people certainly contribute financially to communities in, in very big ways. Uh, they do, you know, they, 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 they shop and they pay taxes still, and they, they you know, they contribute to the, to the economics of a community as well. So if you take older people out of a community, you would also have a challenge there. Um, I mean, clearly, the financing is a big issue, but if you think of it in a broader sense, we're not talking so much, and this is where really the point about intergenerational is, is, is absolutely critical. We're not just saying you have to make special accommodations for older people that will only be good for older people, but these are things that make communities, places, better places to live in for everybody. So, so if you make, um, if you if you create better transportation systems, they can help everybody. So it's more that integration of of the concept of a better place, and and uh, with a lens on all the people. But if you catch some of the issues that are real challenges for all the people, you will also really benefit the younger people. So it's not one or the other. I think it would be really wrong to think of it. We're just really targeting all the people. Um, I think from a rural perspective, particularly, uh, the accommodations for those specifically older people is really very good. It's a really good strategy because they're aging. So rural communities tend to be older, and this is a big generalization, I realize. But we have communities, to give you a local examples, while in the provincial Proportion of older adults, 65 plus in Manitoba, it's 14 percent. In some rural communities, it would be 40, 50 percent. So there's, there are older people in living living in those communities. If they cannot live there, if they cannot age there, they will move out. If they move out, likely a community is not sustainable. Because you're taking a lot of a lot of things out of it and you take even the tax base, the tax dollars out, you're still taking out all the co economic contribution to local businesses, to, to services that those older people provide. So um, the other point, and now this is a rather long answer to this question, but I mean the, the other point that I was trying to make is that this age supportive environments will not come about just from one perspective. This is a larger policy change at any level. It has to be at the provincial level, 
it has to be at the municipal level, but the public has to be behind as well. So there's many levels of influences that have to come together to actually make it, 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 it feasible. I'll stop there. So maybe if Pam wants to, hi Pam, if you want Great. to elaborate, you can uh, elaborate. And I'm not sure if I addressed Cassie's question um, really. Um, um, just before I get to some of the other questions, you had mentioned uh, in your presentation about remote communities and the mining communities, for example, and uh, how they tend to be primarily younger and contrasted that to some of the rural communities where upwards of 50 percent the people can be older. And uh, I've been to Churchill, Manitoba. For those of you who don't know where it is, it's uh, in northern Manitoba on Hudson's Bay. It's a 36-hour train ride from Winnipeg. And uh, it's, it's isolated, it's small, but it does have a stable population. And there are some seniors there. So have there been any uh, any initiatives that have been specifically directed to these remote communities that uh, do exist throughout Manitoba? Yes, it has. And, and Churchill is part of Age Friendly Manitoba. Um, in fact, Churchill might actually be is very remote. Absolutely, it's a long ways up there. Um, it might actually be more. Uh, it might be easier for. Churchill to be age friendly in a way than some other northern communities, and I'm saying that because uh, because of the link to the uh, healthcare resources in Winnipeg. Manitoba is a, is a an odd province in that a lot of the healthcare services, the tertiary healthcare services, are localized in Winnipeg. So people from up north have to come into the city, into into Winnipeg, and Churchill has a good connection there. Um, the other communities, there are other northern communities that are part of age-friendly, and they have been struggling. So if you saw that graph where I lined up the mean age-friendliness, and it goes from pretty low to a little bit higher there, uh, some of those northern communities would be on the low end. And that is partly because there's no, they don't have, people have not historically aged in those places. So. Some of the other communities have had older populations for quite some time, so, so they've adapted to that by, for example, having you know, activities for older people or some housing for older people, maybe a nursing home for older people. Some of those mining towns up north really haven't had that chance yet. Uh, now, this is changing now as people want to age up there. Uh, up in the north, and so so now it becomes an issue of so how do you how do you add some of those services in at this point? And some of them have been um, some of those communities have been struggling. There's no doubt. So it, it's harder, and partly it's 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 way up north. It is really really far, and they can't I draw see. in from other communities uh, that are close. Thanks. Far. So uh, we have a question from Megan. She's thanking you for your presentation. Are there specific criteria or processes for city towns, uh, et cetera, to become age-friendly in Manitoba or Canada, uh, or do they follow the WHO criteria formulated in 2007? Yeah, in, in, in Canada, and Manitoba is, is uh, going with that, uh, they're the mi milestones. So they're the, miles, the age-friendly milestones, you could find those on the FACS, the Public Health Agency of Canada website. Go under age-friendly milestones, you'll see them listed. When you, um, so they're, uh, they're very uh, much aligned with the WHO, uh, uh, what do they call them now, steps to becoming more age-friendly. So it involves uh, uh, engagement, community engagement, uh, and then uh, developing an action plan, and then also evaluating the success of uh, becoming more age-friendly. So those milestones are used in Manitoba, in, uh, in other provinces in Canada. So, and, and, when, and there, uh, when communities in Manitoba attain the milestones, and this would be similar in other provinces who use the milestones, so the FAC milestones, that is, Public Health Agency of Canada milestones, uh, so when a community attains those milestones, then they get a recognition award. 
so that's just basically publicly acknowledge him as having done good work. It does not mean the milestones do not mean the process. The, 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 they specify the process. They don't say that you have to become so and so age friendly, which gets us back to my comment at the very end, to saying you know you're not saying you have to have. I don't know, X number of buses, you have to have X number of uh, buildings that are accessible, you have to have so many support services for seniors in a, in a community. It just lays out what are the processes that you should follow to basically put that aging lens onto your, onto your programs. Great. So go to FACT Thanks. website, so, Age um, Mary asks Under if we can receive the references that have been cited and perhaps you could just send them to Sue, and Sue can post them on the CLSA website. And um, oh, there they are. And uh, you can post yeah. them on the website where the presentation is. Um, we can see about uh, pasting that list of references, or they can just contact you for the list separately. Uh, so Brenda is asking: Are age friendly? Is age friendly actually age friendly? And she's wondering if by contextualizing. Um, the term is age friendly, that we have actually maybe hurt the cause of achieving age friendly communities. And further down, she's also asking if um, uh, why is it that Europe seems to age so much better? Uh, you know, the issue around contextualizing it within aging, that's such a good point, and that keeps coming up as, a, as, a, as an issue. And yeah, what are we really talking about? Really, really, what we're talking about is good places for people. I think the danger of taking it that broad is, is that we lose older adults yet again. Because currently, places are not very people friendly in a lot of ways. Uh, they've become better because of the disability movement also and people you know, complaining, but you know, Getting around can be really hard. So by focusing on older people, we're saying yes, there are different challenges for all that come with aging, and we're highlighting those. Yet at the same time, we always have to, and as I, as I have done talks about this, and as we listen to communities how who actually try to roll this idea out in their communities. There's a, there's a quick addition to that and saying, well, but we're not saying this is only good for older people. We're saying that it is also good for younger people. So, so the comment about if we build places that are good places for older people, we have also built better places for younger people. So it's an, it's an interesting point that I keep coming back to. I, I'm, I would disagree with saying that it actually hurts the cause, but we don't want to argue just for older adults either. I think it becomes it becomes then too much one or the other. We're pitting young against old, and I don't think that's the idea. Just from a very local perspective in terms of when we've had uh, various, I mean, this is coming out in, 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 in the research and evaluation work. Um, the communities that have the best success in, in starting to move towards becoming age-friendly, implementing projects and promoting the idea and raising awareness have actually been intergenerational by design. So they intentionally uh, have, have younger people involved, including, uh, I'm thinking of one particular community at an age-friendly committee, and there is a high school student on it. And so, so you're building that in. You don't want to polarize the discussion around it's us against them. Uh, trying to find it. Why does Europe seem to be aging better? Well, that's a, that's a good one, and I think that's a, a partly it's that social, political, and cultural background. And, and I'm I'm just working on a, a, a paper. Uh, I didn't talk about it at all, but in terms of. Uh, whether people in Winnipeg, uh, we asked people in Winnipeg how important it was to them to, to walk, to walk, to have a walkable neighborhood. And you know what? Not surprisingly, a lot of them say it's not really, really important to them. So here we are on the one hand saying walkable neighborhoods would be not only good for your health, but they're better and everything would be good. But people are not, don't really care about it. So, so being from Europe, I have been contemplating this interesting 
issue, and I think it's because North America was built with sprawl. I mean, Winnipeg is, is urban sprawl. It's a car culture, and it becomes so ingrained that it's really hard to change. European cities are much more walkable right from the design, uh, because historically they did with denser, and they have to make do there, so then cycling becomes an issue. I mean, you try to cycle in Winnipeg, it's really hard, plus you have winters, but apart from that, so I think there's this whole historical, long historical perspective that in many ways our cities, our communities, and I will include rural communities, that also have sprawl, surprisingly, you know, they think they're small, but they also sprawl, they're built the wrong way. So now we have to retrofit them, and we have to change a culture, and that's really quite Great, thanks. Out. So we've got many excellent comments in the chat, and I think one of uh, our listeners' questions was answered by another listener, so that's great. Uh, we are just past 3 o'clock, so unfortunately we are going to have to um, put an end to the webinar, as uh, I'm sure everyone has uh, other things to um, attend to today. Uh, so, Verena, this was an excellent presentation. It generated a whole lot of interest, as you can see by the chat comments, and also a very high number of people signed in today. So, clearly, your topic um, is something that uh, has uh, generated a great deal of interest uh, among uh, Canadian researchers and policymakers, et cetera, in this field. So uh, on behalf of everyone at CLSA and most importantly our listeners, uh, I'd just like to thank you very much for uh, presenting uh, this interesting topic today. Yes, thank you. I'm just reading the comments here. There's some yes, good exactly. comments coming and, uh, in. I think that um, we might uh, want to bring you back uh, for uh, part two uh, perhaps sometime uh, in the fall or the winter, uh, just because uh, uh, I think that uh, there's uh, so much interest in this area. Good point. Yeah, and it's the heat, the heat wave in Paris. Great. Yeah, all, so all it's very, very excellent. That we're not going to be able yeah. to get through them all, uh, but uh, for those of you who are keeping the chat going, great. Thank you very much. Um, thanks again to Verena, and I'd just like to um, give a brief announcement about our next uh, webinar. So this will be the final webinar before the summer. We are not going to have webinars in July and August. We'll um, continue uh, with our webinar series in September. But there's one more at the end of the spring, so it's on June 15th from 1 to 2 in the afternoon Eastern Time, estimating dementia prevalence in Canada using data from national surveys, potential use of CLSA data. And Dr. Julian Mulvale, who is um, an assistant professor in health policy and management at McMaster, is going to present. Uh, the stuff she'll be presenting arose out of a paper on dementia prevalence and cost that was uh, the subject of a workshop retreat at the Alzheimer's Society of Canada last weekend. It's a very interesting paper uh, talking about the challenges of um, measuring dementia prevalence, and although CLSA cannot be used to measure prevalence because we are excluding people with cognitive impairment at baseline, uh, CLSA still has a role to play in estimating uh, the various epidemiologic factors related to dementia. So um, Julian will be talking about that on June 15th, and we look forward to having all of you back to listen to that. And uh, again, thanks, Farina, and we'll look forward to having you back sometime in the fall, perhaps, to continue uh, discussions about age-friendly communities. So we'll sign off now. Thank you, everyone, for joining and participating in the chat, and uh, we look forward to uh, having you back in June, and enjoy the long weekend coming up. Bye now.